Now it is my honor to introduce our commencement speaker, Mr. Ed Ruskis. Ed is an alum and graduated from the 1977 class in machine trades. After graduation and a stint in a tool and die shop in Wilkes-Barre, Ed packed up his car with a few friends and headed towards the mountains of Colorado. After working in a few small machine shops in Boulder, Ed landed his current career job of 32 years and counting at Ball Aerospace in 1980. What lay be before him was a career starting out with the machining of basic aerospace parts. His work quickly grew into what Ed became into part of an in intricate team member for a program that built the Space Shuttle Star Trackers program. The magnitude of the programs would become more complex with Ed's involvement in the Hubble Space Telescope Corrective Optics Program and subsequently in a multitude of projects supporting our national security. In 1997, the opportunity availed itself to Ed to move into the commercial division of that company, Ball Aerospace, I mean, of Ball. He became a lead technician in the first commercial American launch from Russia. Ed also participated with the team that built the deep impact mission that hit the Temple One Comet in 2005. Over the course of the past five years, Ed has been a major team player in building and launching a series of global imaging satellites. His latest project was the highly successful build and launch of the NASA NPP weather satellite, a system that will help meteorologists predict potentially dead storms. Students in the class of 2012 and assembled guests, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Mr. Ed Ruskis. That's quite an introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say something to the alumni. It wasn't until Dr. Ann took over that uh, she made us feel part of the school again, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Mr. Mashura. I know you're here somewhere for 40 years of teaching, and you guys are a lot smarter than we were because it took him three years to drill it into our skulls and it only took him two to get it into yours. <laughs> and I do want to make one comment. You guys all have this in your handouts? So you see, boys and girls, we all don't end up born looking like your dad. <laughs> um, I brought this with me. This is my degree. It has been sitting on my desk for 34 years, and every day I've looked at it and said thank you. And I'm very serious about it. I never have forgotten where I came from. And please, as you go through your life, don't do that. It, it's, it's so important to understand the energy it took to get you there. It doesn't seem that long ago that I was sitting where you are now, wondering what the heck I was going to do. I wasn't one of the students that have the gold braids around them. I was one of the other students, the ones that seemed lost. And you know what I mean. I had moved from New York City to Pittston at the age of 14, which was very difficult. I barely got through high school, and I chose JST, Johnson School of Technology, on a lark to keep me from Vietnam or Canada as a conscientious objector. Even upon graduating, I was pretty lost inside. I worked in Wilkes-Barre after graduation at Muskin Pools. I was part of a couple guys uh, that were asked to join their, join their tool room on the first ones, and we did well, obviously, because they hired a few more before they went out of business. In the tool room, we're building dyes and injection molds. But some of the guys who worked there were just plain old grouchy. I started to second guess my choice of trades. I didn't really didn't want to end up like them. 
I decided one day to move to Colorado from a conversation I had with Mr. Marino, who was our shop teacher here at Johnson, an old Italian toolmaker who didn't mince words and was the first senior male positive influence in my life who pushed me. He told me about the opportunities out west. My parents were sad, but I knew I had to go. Whether it was my affinity to party too much or to hang out with the people I went to high school with for too long or whatever, I was definitely unsettled. So I put my toolbox in my car and headed out west in June of 1979. As I was traveling on I-70, I stopped in Kansas at 3.30 in the morning to watch the thunderstorms in the distance. We don't see those on the East Coast. It was unbelievable, the lightning and the colors in the distance. I, I felt, with the benefit of hindsight, I felt like I was in, from Jack Kerouac's 1959 book, On the Road. I was between the east of my youth and the west of my future. I just knew in my soul that it was the right thing to do. And you know, sometimes you're gonna have the life, in, you're gonna have the unknown. You, you know, you're scared now. You don't know what you're going to do. But I want you to look forward and don't be afraid, okay? I want you to be confident in your education and be confident in who you are, okay? Promise yourself that you're going to do that. When I got to Boulder, I landed my first job at a shop by showing the owner my resume and my degree. And at that time, JST gave you a little credit card-sized laminated copy of a degree to carry in your wallet. I thought it was corny, but that little thing got me hired. I actually interviewed in the parking lot in the shop with my cut off shorts, and I'm not kidding, I tore, the sh I tore the sheet of the yellow pages out, and I folded it up, and I stuck it in the back of my shorts, and I went for a bike ride around to the different machine shops in Boulder. It was a lot different than the East Coast, I was for sure. But I started to feel more and more confident every day and with every paycheck. Even though I tried to stay close to people back here, those relationships just weren't working out. Through your life, you're going to have a shift. I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you if it's chemistry. I can't tell you if it's your brain waves. I can't tell you if it's your relationships. But it will in your life happen. I can't tell you if it's maturity. But three or four times in your life, there's a major shift. You wake up one day, and you're not that person that you were the day before. So when it shows up, don't be scared. It's natural. I worked in that shop for a year, and then I got on with Ball Aerospace in 1980 because of a conversation with a guy at lunch. I wasn't looking for work, I was content. But sometimes the universe has a way of pushing you in a direction that you need to go. After I started with Ball, I worked in the shop for a while and also started working on some cool space stuff. I was part of a team. As I went from project to project, I grew as a person. And between these projects, I worked in the shop just making parts for the next excursion or next project. And that is exactly what I'm doing now. I'm back in the shop. And i got to give a shout out to you machinists uh, who are working with Mastercam in SolidWorks. Because the invention of the microchip was after I got into the trade. And I'm, I'm relearning the trade. So my hats are off to you guys and gals. I also worked in the maintenance department for a while, rebuilding the machine tools from the experience that I, hear at jo that I got here at Johnson. I don't know if they still do it in the shop, but I was taking apart ma machine tools when I was here, so I, that actually helped me out at my work. I married my next-door neighbor, Sherry. Sometimes when you are looking too hard, you can't find a solution right in front of you. I have found you need to let life unfold and not get too stressed about it. Life happens. Stress, kids, bills, in-laws, we all got them. Just try to enjoy them. This thing called relationships is what separates us from the monkeys. The company was growing and so was I. I was working on bigger and bigger projects. Crest, Herbs, RME, which was part of the Star Wars. I got to sit in the commander's seat of the shuttle Columbia while working at Case, that's Kennedy Space Center on the Star Trackers. Not bad for a Polish machinist. Even my mom and dad were proud of me. My parents kept a picture of me from the launch tower on their TV in the living room, and that's when you know you made it. That's when I felt I had made it. That's when I thought that maybe, just maybe, my dad and I and I would have a relationship. I knew I gave it a good go at fostering that relationship, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. There are hurdles in life that you have to overcome. 
Most of them we put there ourselves. Some take longer than others. When working as a team, and I want to emphasize this because I see a lot of this in our new age of America. When working as a team, you have to be able to take criticism and to not take it personally or get mad. You have to be able to negotiate. Just ask anyone who's been married a long time. For all you guys out there, everything is negotiable, right? Take your work relations for what they are. They are not personal. Know that. Keep your work and your business, your business and your personal relationships separate. That will serve you well in the long run. By changing and growing, I got better and better opportunities. Sometimes, but sometimes I received really crappy assignments, but they always led me to a better place the next year. It's like the yin and the yang. Life is always a balance, and the only constant in life is change. When you open your heart and understand that and don't fight it, life is a lot easier. For about the last 15 years, I have been building spacecraft pretty consistently. I have to constantly remind myself what a cool job it is and not get stuck in the mud of corporate America or the day-to-day -day stress of the work, and there's plenty of it. And let me say, after some of these launch campaigns, we just don't want to talk to each other for a while. It's just, uh, it's hard to explain. It's like a family that doesn't get along, you know, at Christmas time. Like that Christmas dinner is a year long, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things. Sorry, Father. <laughs> when you go to Google Earth, I was on the teams that built and launched the spacecraft that produced those images. I had the opportunity to go to Russia twice. We were the first Americans to launch out of Plesetsk which was their premier nuclear base. When I was on a launch tower in northern Russia, I stood there looking out over the forest, over Siberia, in amazement that I was even there, that this brought me there, that not bad again for a Polish machinist. If only Mr. Marino and my mom and dad could have seen me. I've got to work on teams that fuel spacecraft with hydrazine, which is a pretty nasty chemical used to steer the spacecraft in a vacuum of space. I was on the team that built the cameras and the telescope on a spacecraft called Deep Impact that hit the Comet Temple 1 in 2005. That was really cool. We took a spacecraft, came in two pieces, one piece hit the comet, and the, other, the, other, the other half of the spacecraft took pictures of it as it went by. It's on NASA's website um, called Deep Impact. In the last 10 years, my family has also sacrificed for me as I, and have shared the pain. I have been gone from home from 18 months, supporting launch campaigns, fueling ops, and basically supporting space stuff in the field. I even received an opportunity, opportunity to go to Nice, France, which is on the southern coast of France, you know, Cannes, Mandalou, Saint-Tropez, for three weeks to help an instrument we had built and deliver. Now, my wife, Sherry, was upset at that one. But she was a trooper because we thought for just a moment about her coming along and leaving our kids home alone who were teenagers at the time. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a good decision. <laughs> I still laugh about it. I was laughing about it when I wrote it. <laughs> Remember that no man is an island, and you can't do it alone. You can't reach your goals alone. You can't get through life by yourself. We all need love and support and guidance. But that also means that you have to reach into your soul and give that love and support and guidance to the people in your life that need you. I firmly believe that what goes around comes around. If you give it, you get it. I have come a long way since I left here in 1979. I was just like you, in more ways than just miles. I want to say what an honor it is for me to be able to do this and to speak to you. When Katie Leonard asked me to speak to you, I was overcome with emotion. I, I truly was. It took me a couple of days to answer if I would do this. And I asked her, why would you, ha why would you have me do this when you have such successful alum alumni from this school? And she said she just wanted to hear my story. So there it was. And then, you know, raising a family, having a home, staying married, saving a few bucks, being productive members of society is successful also. We all don't have to be Donald Trump. 
My father was a tailor, a furrier, and a master butcher for the Brass Row restaurants in New York City in the 1950s. And that was a big reason I came to the school. He had said to me, I will probably never be rich as a tradesman, but I will always be able to put food on a table. And he was right. My kids now are learning a trade. They're both becoming chefs in San Francisco. Speaking of saving a few bucks, this is for you. If you start now, if you put 10% of your earnings off the top into long-term investments and never touch it, you'll, never, you'll have plenty of money for your senior years. And they get here way faster than you think. Because life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer to the end you get, the faster it goes. <laughs> Winston... <laughs> Winston Churchill said, sometimes it's not good enough to do our best. We must do what is required. There is no luck. You have to be prepared for the opportunity that presents itself to you. Invictus states, you are the master of your fate and the captain of your ship. Never doubt that. Your character will be challenged. But always, always do the right thing. Be responsible for the space that you hold on this planet. In this country, we have begun to lose and overlook the greatness of trade schools. By sitting here, it shows that you are the best of America. Johnson College is not Rutgers or Yale, John but Johnson College is an elite school for working America. You have earned this ticket as your key to the world. Where you go and, in, and what you do is entirely up to you. This is America. We don't see people going south over the Rio Grande or swimming to Cuba. These are tough times for sure, but this is a country of dreams of what can be, not of what was or is. What is your dream? So I want you to go out this door to that street outside. It leads to anywhere in America that you choose. You don't even have to ask permission. Just do it. As I felt I owed it to Mr. Marino, and to you, Mr. Mashira, and to my parents for believing me, you guys and girls owe it to your school, the people who helped pay for your education, your alumni, the future students of Johnson College. But most of all, you owe it to yourself. Don't waste this opportunity. You have the ability. You know you do. Now go do it. Thank you. Outstanding job, Ed. Thank you very, very much for that talk. I'd like to invite Mr. Dan Blevins up, a representative from the uh, Johnson College Student Government, who would like to give you a small token of our appreciation. Hey. Wow, this is a surprise. <laughs> Presented in appreciation by the class of 2012 to Ed Bruskus of <laughs> class of 1977 for the commencement address, Johnson College. Where were you Here in 77? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah, I, saw you, I saw the last guy. You're awesome. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. I really enjoyed those people. You did? Yeah. Thank Thank you so much. Much. Oh, and here's your gift. <laughs> we actually got one. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I there was no <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan and Ed. We are so proud that Ed Ruskus is one of our own. And Johnson, a Johnson College alum, what a great and outstanding way to celebrate 100 years of Johnson College history. I want to thank you personally and as part of the student body also would like to say what a great address that was. Ed, thank you again.